Welcome to the Real Estate Asset Management Podcast brought to you by Break of Day Capital. The show focuses on educating syndicators and apartment owners on how to build systems and manage their properties more efficiently to become a best in class operator. 100% straight talk. Let's jump in. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Asset Management Podcast. I'm your host, Gary Lipsky with Break of Day Capital. Be sure to join our Facebook group, Asset Management Mastery, where we have a great community of thousands of like-minded individuals sharing resources and best practices. Today on the podcast, I'm honored to have such an esteemed guest in Peter Linneman. Peter is the founding principal of Linneman Associates, LLC, a leading real estate advisory firm. For more than 40 years, he has advised leading corporations and served on over 20 public and private boards, including serving chairman of Rockefeller Center Properties, where he led successful restructuring on, and sale of Rockefeller Center in the mid-1990s. He has published over 100 scholarly articles, eight editions of the acclaimed book, Real Estate Financial Investments, Risks and Opportunities, and the widely read Lineman Letter Quarterly Report. He is also the co-creator of the popular and highly regarded Real Estate Finance and Investment Certification course, and most recently, he co-authored the best-selling book, The Great Age Reboot, Cracking the Longevity Code for a Younger Tomorrow. Choosing the right insurance coverage for multifamily properties isn't that complicated, if you know who to talk to. At the Garzella Group, we're uniquely qualified to help you navigate the range of policy choices you have, and we're committed to saving you 30% in the process. We do intensive market research and have nationwide relationships, so we can find coverage other insurance brokers simply can't. We should talk. Go to quotenow.biz, and we'll start the conversation. Thanks for joining us, Peter. Would you like to add a little bit more about yourself and what you do? Well, thanks for having me. Um, I'm in Philadelphia, and Fly Eagles Fly. is uh, We're doing this. I don't know when this will go up, but it's the Friday before the uh, NFC uh, Championship uh, on Sunday, so fly eagles fly. Um, the only thing I would add, you know, I, I I taught a long time at Wharton, and so I had the good pleasure of uh, a lot of great students and a lot of great opportunities, and um, learned real estate from some amazing people like Al Taubman and, and many others who were very kind to me in my earlier life, and uh, taught me a lot. Nice. Yeah, my sister. Uh, went to to UPenn many years ago. <laughs> well, I was there. I was there. Yep. Yep. Well, today I want to talk about the multifamily outlook for 2023. Obviously, there's um, a lot of unknown, a lot of moving pieces, and who better to speak to than to you regarding that outlook? Um, so, you know, I'd love to get your take on the current marketing market conditions and how you see it potentially playing out over the course of the year. So as you well know, and your listeners know, multifamily is a battle, or not a battle, it's a combination of how's NOI doing and how does the capital market view that NOI? How hungry is the capital market for that NOI? Um, currently, or starting about August, late August into September, the capital market said, we aren't interested in anything. And there was a lender strike. Banks in particular, as the primary source of capital, said to everybody, not just real estate, no, we don't want to lend. We're only going to lend to those willing to pay big spreads at higher interest rates. And the reason was because uh, the Fed had told them they were going to keep interest rates low for a good while. They had a very active first two-thirds of the year at the major banks. They had a lot of loans in warehouse to be syndicated and securitized. The rates rose very quickly, and the Fed said, oops, we were only kidding. Their loans were sitting at losses. And so instead of being able to keep spinning that money and make another round of loans before year end, they sat on it because they didn't want to sell at losses. Nobody likes selling at losses. They could afford to sell at losses 
it wasn't like uh, 1990 for the SNLs or in 2009, where if they sold at losses, they were out of business, literally out of business. They have enough capital. The Fed has given them stunning amounts of capital. We'll give them more if they need it. So they can afford to sell it in the sense they don't go out of business, but they could not afford to sell it in the late months of, of 2022 because it would have wiped out their bonuses. And I don't know about you, but I want my bonus and I can go on a lender strike for, I can't go on a lender strike forever, but I can go on a lender strike for two months, three months, four months, five months, because I know I have the money to sell them eventually at a loss once my bonus is paid. So year end 2020 ended, they didn't get stunning bonuses, but they'll do okay because the first eight months were highly productive. They sat on their hands. When they sat on their hands, most equity sat on their hands. The non-bank banks depend on banks for their money, so they largely sat on their hands. So that's why I focus on the banks as the kind of crystallizer. Now, I can tell you as somebody who's been on a lot of boards, I'm not on a bank board, but I'm on other company boards. And right now we're establishing budgets. And as soon as we establish budgets, the comp committee establishes compensation goals for the year. Gee, the banks need to sell those loans and they can afford to sell those loans and they need to sell them to recycle the money and get origination fees and syndication fees, okay? When are they going to sell them? As soon as the budget locks in that they can sell them this year and still get bonuses. And of course, the budget's going to say that because otherwise they won't be able to make loans. So by the end of this month, very early next month, the banks will have compensation targets locked in that will allow them to sell loans at losses. That means the remainder of the first quarter and into the second quarter, you'll start seeing banks sell their loans, and as they do, they'll lend, and as they lend, that'll happen with a lag, and as they lend, spreads will come down, and as they lend, equity will come back because it's sitting on the sideline, and as it does, cap rates, all, all my research shows cap rates aren't determined by interest rates, they're determined by capital flow, so the cap rates that gap when money stop flowing will reduce a bit, and you'll see the capital market valuing NOI not terribly dissimilar to 2018, 2019, uh, and let's say most of 2022 or the first eight months of 2022, okay? Not the last four months. So the capital market, I think, by the second half of this year, because you can, you can see how what I described on the capital market is not an overnight. There are steps. You got to give me a budget. I've got to then tell, I got to sell it. Once I sell it, I got to develop a book of business. I got to close the book of business. It's going to take a little while. But by the second half, capital will be flowing and capital markets will look very different than the last few months. Another way of saying it, greed will replace fear. And greed always replaces fear at some point. So that's the capital market outlook for 2022. Kind of fear or sitting on the lender strike kind of predominating the more or less the first half and the return of greed and active lenders in the second half. Um, and then receding cap rates. Then you go to the NOI side, rent and occupancy. As you know, you've seen a big drop in starts. And that's because projects don't pencil at higher interest rates on the float side. And construction costs are up. And not only are construction costs up, projected construction costs are even higher, right? So we, 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 we've got this odd period where contractors are saying, not only do I want, uh, let, me, let me put it in the context of oil, just for an example. You know, oil went from 60 to 125 in a matter of two months. 
And so not only were they saying, I've got to be covered at 125, I got to be covered at 150 or 170 if I'm going to do a guaranteed contract, right? right? So those guarantees come back. Well, take oil. Oil's back down to 80. And that starts working its way through. And lumber, lumber was at 1,800. It's back down to three, whatever, 380 or whatever number it's at. So it takes a while. So supply is kind of going to be dropping in the first quarter of this year. Not good for developers, good for owners, right? I mean, that's the, that's the when people ask, how's multifamily going to do? Are you a developer or an owner? I'm happy when developers are unhappy if I'm an owner, right? That's the kind of trade-off. So I think you're going to see the first quarter starts are going to continue to go down, probably flatten out late in the second quarter, and then start rising in the third and fourth as people who delayed projects do them. Um, you, the interest rate is up. You don't have the you don't have equity. You can't get the loan. Uh, Etc. Um, so I think on the supply side, NOI looks good, and on the demand side, it's good. And the reason I say it's good is we have a fundamental shortfall of housing because of NIMBYism. NIMBYism has probably created a three and a half percent shortfall in the supply of single-family homes. People have to live somewhere. In some markets, it's created a shortfall or submarkets created a shortfall in multi. Um, I, I want to be in a market where there's a shortfall, right, as an investor. Um, not every day, but most days turn out pretty good for you. Money will return. We have no inflation right now. We literally have no inflation. November and December data clearly show no inflation in the U.S. economy. You say, but it said year over year, it was five and a half percent. I don't care about year over year. I care about now. And what you saw in November was no increase from the prices of October. None. And you saw in December, if anything, they were down a little bit. And you're going to see in January, they're down a little bit. So we have no inflation in the economy. Now, that's not to say all prices are falling. It's just to say, if you have zero inflation, half the prices are up and half the prices are down, and few of them are up a lot, a few of them are down a lot, right, and averages out. So we have mild deflation as we're sitting here. At some point, even the Fed will notice that. And, and at some point, the Fed will say, we don't need to keep raising rates. In fact, we've got to reduce rates. And they're going to be too late reducing rates, just like they were too late raising rates. But they're going to reduce them. Uh, by the way, they're going to raise it one more time. Why? I don't know about uh, you're younger. I went to Catholic <laughs> school. I'm 71. I went to Catholic school back in the day. Ask your parents or grandparents. Um, and when they punish a kid, you'd say, well, why did you do it 11 times? And one was for good measure, right? One was, you know, that extra for good measure. And you're like, well, the kid didn't need one more whack. I don't even know they needed 10, much more 11, right? right? That's the Fed. They're going to do one more for good measure. They didn't need to do as much as they did. If inflation is zero, do you really need a 5% interest rate? I don't think so. You might want a 3% or a 2% kind of interest rate if inflation's zero. You have a long discussion. So demand is in good shape. Household, a very interesting phenomena. Essentially, what you have on the demand side is a war going on between the consumer uh, in general and the Fed and also regulation, right? But let's just focus on the consumer. The consumer typical is your age. You bought your house seven years ago. The typical consumer, I'm not talking about the renter for a moment, typical consumer is your age, you bought your house seven years ago or eight years ago, you locked in a 2% or lower mortgage um, before the beginning of 2022 for 30 years. It's like, sign me up. You have two job openings 
for every person looking for a job. Your wages have outstripped inflation and uh, over the last three years, and your wealth has outstripped inflation by 7% over the last three years. Now, you were happier when it outstripped it by 20, but I'm not so unhappy that it's 3%, I mean, 7% higher. That's net of inflation. So the consumer's going, yeah, I'm in pretty good shape. We're creating jobs. Unemployment claims came out yesterday, like, you know, really low. You know, we're going to get good jobs data this month, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So the consumer's doing pretty well. Meanwhile, the Fed is saying, we got to get 2 million people unemployed. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, every one of those people is generating about 70,000 of GDP. And GDP is still below trend. Now, if you're still below trend and you still don't have people back to work the way they should be back to work, why are you trying to create unemployment? We've added 4.7 million people since the beginning of the pandemic, and we've only added 1.2 million jobs. Okay, Imagine a country that only had 1.2 million workers for 4.7 million population. You'd say, we need a million and a half or a million workers. We don't need a million fewer. That would be an economy of 4.7 million people with no workers. That would be absurd. Even in Europe, that would be absurd. And you kind of go, I don't know what the Fed's thinking. And it, it's really crazy. And you have to believe sooner or later they'll see the light and they'll surrender and do the right thing. But in the meantime, there's a real battle. And by the way, just as a add on, when the Fed announces that they've laid off 2% of their employees, at least I can work up a rooting interest in them trying to get rid of a whole bunch of employees in the rest of the economy. Yep, yep. Well, I got a bunch of questions from, from, from that. Um, I'm curious to know why you project, why, why is construction projecting higher in the future when we're getting, you know, infl inflation is, is, is flat right now? And what your guess is on the uh, housing shortfall in the U.S.? Because I've heard numbers three and a half million, four and a half, five and a half. You know, I mean, every article you read has got a different number. So I'm curious where you stand on that. OK, on the first one, I do think you're going to see uh, housing multifamily, especially down in the first half of the year it starts. Right. And then picking up from that low. Uh, but, uh, but I was there. talking about the uh, the cost. I, maybe I misheard it, but oh, I thought the cost. You, okay, the cost of construction the cost you is thought real was going to go up. Yeah. The, the cost is real simple. Interest costs are going to come down by the second half of the year. Yeah. And you've already seen product. You know, eight ten months ago, you not only couldn't get product if you found it; it was really expensive. Materials, right? Today, you don't hear people complaining about not being able to find materials, and at least as much is cheaper as is more expensive. And lumber being an extraordinary example. Now, like aluminum's up, so it depends. Um, but for example, China opening up will help supply of a lot of product, right? And some of those are building supply related. Right. Um, as opposed to when they were locking up every other day, some city, right? And so I just see supply. Supply is coming back. Supply has come back. That's why inflation's down, uh, not just in construction. So I see construction costs probably moderating. And by the end of the year, they're going to be lower than today, I believe. And the only wild card is labor, right? The only wild card is labor. And that's a real part of construction costs. I'm not trying to suggest it isn't. Why do we have high labor costs? It's because we've discouraged people from working. I mean, with various policies, all well-intended policies, right? There's no malevolence in these policies, but we were paying people more not to be employed than be employed for better part of a year and a half. We have told people, um, think of somebody 28 years old, we've told them for three years, you don't have to pay your student loan. You don't think that discourages them from working? 
I mean, if we told them you have to pay your student loan, it has to make them a bit more incentivized to work. Now, and not everybody's going to stop working on that. All these policies are at the margin, right? They're all at the margin. Um, so we need more people working. But I think you see a moderation as materials come down. Dramat Just don't forget how much um, lumber came down, how fast lumber came down. Imagine that happened to every material from its peak, right? That's going to be a dramatic. And then you've got labor still going up. On the, um, um, on the single family side, so I'll give you what my numbers are. Uh, on the multi side, we're about a half a million short. On a national level, about a half a million shortfall uh, of true supply demand balance. That's on 44 million units, right? So 2% or no, excuse me, half a percent, some number like that. Not huge, but in some markets it is big, right? Sub sub markets it's big, others it's not. And when you have a shortfall for something people really want or need, that's when you see rents run. That's when you see prices run. You don't need a big shortfall in something that people really want. For bubble gum, you need a big shortfall to make the price run. But for housing, you don't need a big shortfall for the price to run. They're going to pay what they have to pay. On the single family side, I'm doing from memory, my numbers are around 3.5 million shortfall on about, a, on about 90 million units, 93 million units to give an order of magnitude. Um, and you go, okay, let's just call it a three, three and a half percent shortfall. Three, three and a half percent shortfall for something people want. Remember, we have a shortfall in its competitor, Ren, Renning. You, you see prices go up. Now, they're not going up currently, but that's the lender strike that's causing that. There's fundamental demand, supply imbalance, but there's a rent, there's a lender strike making it difficult, but it can't make it difficult forever. So, and when you say, can I get numbers as high as 4.5% reasonably? Yes. And I can get numbers as low as maybe 2.5% million, um, but not lower than that. And my best estimate comes out to around three and a half million on the single family side. By the way, one other point, the big surge in demand for multifamily, you know, the one that appeared out of nowhere and got everybody near double digit increases, many cases, real double digit increases, it's important to understand what it, what it was driven by. It took me a while to figure it out. I think the data supports it. So prior to COVID, there were a lot of people who had roommates, including their parents, right, as their roommate. They were living at home. They had jobs. And it was okay to live at home because they worked all day and partied all night. And so they didn't have to deal with their roommates. And they didn't have to deal with the inconvenient living situation, if you will. Think of people who had three roommates in Brooklyn, right? They didn't have to deal, or Venice Beach. They didn't have to deal that it's a thousand foot apartment with four people, four, you know, four roommates um, because they worked all day and partied all night. And then what happened during COVID was either they lost their jobs so they weren't working all day, or if they were working, they were a lot of them were working at home all day. And that was a disaster because everybody was there. And you can imagine parents and you can imagine arm's length roommates, like I'm talking about. And they, and they couldn't party all night, right? There was nowhere you could party. And so a whole bunch of people, I estimate about a million. Now, remember, million is about 2% two and a, about two percent of the entire multifamily housing stock, about a million of them decided between about December 2020 and about February of 2022, I got to get out of here. And whether it was the parent who decided it or the kid or the parent subsidized it, or there's a lot of ways, 
you had a surge of about a million who left roommates and moved in. But that's over. That was on top of the normal multi-demand growth, right? So you have the normal multi-demand growth that occurs in any year plus this turbo charge. And I don't think the turbo charge so much goes away because once they're on their own, absent a bad economy, they're going to stay on their own, right? Um, but that is a vulnerability. If you did get an economic downturn, you could get a surge the other way because these people have had roommates that way. But I think don't expect it to happen again. You're back to normal multifamily demand now. Yeah, we saw, you know, we, we were any any comp we walked, our property is close to 100 percent for a long time. And then come November 2022, we're like, what the heck is happening? You know, it's just we just hit a wall at all of our properties, you know. Right. And that wall, I think, is a return to normalcy. When I say normal, all I mean is normal multifamily growth. How many kids graduated high school? How many graduated college? How many came out of the military? Uh, you, know, you name it. Versus how many got married and they wanted to buy a home or, you know, et cetera. That normal demand. And the reason it hit a wall is if you have normal multifamily demand um, and there's no inflation, how much would you expect rents to go up? There's no inflation. Yeah. yeah. So a little bit, right? A little bit. What's a little bit? One, two percent over a year, maybe. Right. Well, as inflation ended. So did the ability to push rents because you don't have the fundamentals there to push rent. You were pushing rents. You know, you you were saying, great, we're pushing rents by eight percent. I'd say, yes, but inflation was seven, six and a half. And God bless, you were able to push it by 8%. But pushing rent by 8% in a world of 7% inflation is indistinguishable by from pushing rents by 1% in a world of zero inflation or zero in a world of minus 1%. And if it's 1% to zero, on an annual basis, that means on a monthly or quarterly basis, it's rounding error. That's what I think is going on. So based on your your numbers as far as, you know, um, units short, is it sounds almost like built to rent would be a really good play if you're if you're talking about it's mostly on the single family homes. And so is that of it, it would that be a huge um, that? That's sort of where I come out. Yeah. That's sort of where I come out. The only thing that keeps it from being as, quote, articulate as you stated it is where. <laughs> is where. Because let's face it, some of those houses that are shortfall, I don't want to, I don't want to live in them where you're going to build them. I want to live in them over in that school district. And you're going to build them in this school district. And I don't want to be in this school district. You know, you didn't hear me when I shouted that. I want to be in that. And you say, but I can't build in that school district, right? So there is, it is exactly what you said up to that very micro. And of course, to get a home, would they settle on your school district? And the answer is, probably for a couple of years, which is the point of the rental part. And then somebody's going to die over in the school district I really want to be in. And I'll go there then. I mean, that's kind of the dynamic. I'm putting a very cool, I mean, a very, uh, what, a very pointed face on it, right? But I think that's the spirit. Because the shortfall is much more in I care about school districts. I care about uh, backyards. I care about uh, softball team, uh, you know, uh, soccer leagues and softball teams in the neighborhood than the typical multi renter. Now, there are people who are renting multi like that. It's not like there are none, 
but the stereotype, at least, you would do for the single family shortfall is not the stereotype you do for the renter. There are some, but not. And, and so that's why the rent, look, when you rent, what you're really doing is um, when you build to single family rent, you're putting up a down payment for them. And a lot of people don't have a down payment. I mean, you're not lending them the down payment. You're doing it as equity and you want an equity return on the fact you did the down payment. But um, you're providing capital that they don't have and you're charging them for it on a monthly basis. And you're saying, I don't want a debt return. I want an equity return. And the other is you're trying to give them a product more akin to what fits them than the typical multi does. Yep, absolutely. You want to, you're creating more of a real, real home for them without having yeah. an out of pocket expense. Right. Right. Yeah. What are your, some of your favorite markets and what are your least favorite markets as you look forward, you know, you know towards the end of 2023, 2024? Interesting that, you know, over the years I get at the, first of all, I have to ask for developers or for owners, right? right? Um, for developers, it's an easy answer. Just go where population growth has occurred for the last 10 or 20 years. Developers generally make their money off of the development fee. I'm not saying they don't deserve it, but they are driven by the development fee. They're driven by velocity. They're driven by growth. Development is about satisfying growth. So go to the growth market. So where do I like for developers? Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, um, uh, Austin, Atlanta, Miami, um, Orlando, Vega, you know, not surprise Phoenix, go to places where there's growth. And okay, they might be a little oversupplied today, but by the time you get your permits and so forth, it won't be so, you know, and it'll work its way through. Um, almost all of those are not high on my list as an owner. Because the fact is you're constantly going to face new product. Constant, not just new, fine, I'm not bothered by new supply. If demand's growing 3% and supply grows 3%, that's fine. But it's a little skewed in that the demand will grow and all the new supply will tend to be better than my product, right? Just and so, for example, I own an apartment project in New Philadelphia, Ohio. Okay, it's like 208 units. And you like the name, been, so that's why you're invested. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> and it's you know, it was a play on natural gas infrastructure, et cetera. It's done okay. Um, well, nobody's ever going to build 208 units there, right? The Bad news is there's never going to be enough demand for somebody to build 200 units. The good news is I'll always be the best product in town, right? Unless I let it be rodent infected. But, you know, if I manage it all well, I'll always be the best product forever. Um, you can't say that in Houston. I could have pretty close to the best product today. And in 10 years of doing two and a half to 3% a year, there's no way I'm still probably the best product. I can still be a good product, but I'm, it's unlikely I'm going to be the best. That's the problem with those high growth. So I tend to like markets where it's a little harder to build, you know, fine. No place is impossible to build. So you remember, in the, I think it was Godfather 2, when Michael Corleone wanted to kill Hyman Roth. And, and, and Robert Duvall says to him, Tom Hagen says to him, you can't kill everybody. And he says, everybody can be killed. You know, everybody. And it's like every market can be overbuilt. Everybody says it can't, but it can. Um, just give it time. So all you can hope for is a bit of lag. And so I just give you a stereotype. I told you I like Phoenix, right? If I like Phoenix, I probably disproportionately like Scottsdale. Little harder, right? Little harder. Um, if I like Charleston, which I do, um, I disproportionately like the peninsula, right? As opposed to, 
Um, it's that kind of exercise. And you can find those in different markets. I like, I've always liked Raleigh Durham. There's a little, it's not that hard to build, but there's a little lag built in. Nashville, good demand. Some of the sub markets have lags uh, built in, et cetera. So uh, largely what I'm looking for is where's their demand growth because of population with a, enough lag. The, the peninsula of Charleston is a good example, right? Of there's enough uh, environmental and historic sensitivity there that it's going to keep it slowed. Not going to stop it, right? It's going to keep it slowed. So I benefit from the lag. I don't benefit forever, but I, I benefit from the lag. It's like, you know, float. It's the equivalent of financial float for a bank. You know, right. you do a transfer from your bank to my bank and somehow neither of us have access to the money for three days. The banks make a lot of money in the form of pennies. That's kind of what I mean by the lag that happens. NIMBYism, okay, maybe in Santa Barbara shuts down supply, but in most places, NIMBYism slows it more than kills it. And so you get a kind of carry, if you will. You get that float. So earlier in our in our conversation, you mentioned, you know, the Fed's going to lower rates, which we all know is going to happen. When is your, your prediction um, seemed earlier than than I would have thought? I'm, I'm, and you didn't make a prediction, but you kind of alluded to it. So I'm curious when you think the Fed will start. If I had to up. pick. This is hard because the Fed, not just this Fed, has a, I'm an old Milton Friedman student. And one of the points that Milton always made is they're always late and they right. always overreact. And we've seen this again. Now, they, to be fair to the Fed, they were not late in March 2020. They acted fast. Right. They acted vigorously. So I can't say they always. That was... We don't know what's going to happen. Make sure there's liquidity. Let's do it. But they were very late because it was clear or pretty clear by what, November, December 2020, we had survived. We don't need zero rates. We should be moving the rate up 25 basis points every two months, something like that. So everybody can adjust nightly, nicely. They didn't. They basically said they were going to do the same thing as they did in the 2010s, which was ridiculous, keeping it at zero, literally zero for eight years, made no sense. So um, they're going to be late. They should cut the rate this next time. They won't, but they should. They probably should reduce it down to like three and a half or three. But they're not. Um, therefore, and it's hard to, I don't know about you, but I think most humans find it hard to admit they're wrong and are slow to admit they're wrong. I certainly am. Uh, fortunately, I'm never wrong. Um, <laughs> my wife would of 50 years would disagree. Uh, no, but I, therefore, I think probably by May, uh, they're going to be saying they're going to claim credit for stopping inflation. They had almost nothing to do with it. It was all about supply coming back. There's no way monetary policy could have acted fast enough to create the zero inflation of the last three months because interest rates weren't high enough. And monetary policy takes six to 18 months and the interest rate wasn't that high in July yet. Right in August, it wasn't that high yet. Didn't get really high until the last two 75 bip increases. Right, that's when it really pushed it. Well, that's not into what? That's November, December with the last two. That's the problem. Is those are out there as dampening factors six to eighteen months out. So if I had to predict May, something like that, they do a 25 basis point cut. By then, it should have been down to 3%, my guess. But they're going to go more slowly. They, they're they slow almost always. Um, they overreact. It's a little hard because 
what you're trying to predict is a history of irrational slowness and irrational overreact. Um, and, and predicting irrational is always very hard. It's hard enough to predict the rational. You know, it, it's one of the problems. I don't know if you have kids, but the, one of the hardest things of dealing with kids is it's hard enough to predict what a human will do, but <laughs> one whose brain's not fully functioning yet and is really hard, right? And I'm not saying the Fed has not got a brain that function, but it, it, it's an institution that has that built into it. And I do have two, uh, two teenage girls, so yeah, I'm I'm in the uh, thick of it a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Not by the way that they're they're not evil intended. They're they're intelligent, right? Just really, you know, kind of really. <laughs> yeah. When so obviously there's there's no the rate doesn't. You know, we'll always kind of keep moving. But where, do you feel like there's a, a settlement point where the Fed, you know, lower, you know, lowers the rate too, and we kind of yeah. ride that for a bit? We're going to get down. We could get some substantial negative inflation because of all. Like, think of lumber, right? I mean, just across the economy. Think of oil across the economy, right? We could get some. I think more likely is we'll bounce around the first quarter or so of zero to a bit negative, um, which would make it like six months of zero to negative. Um, I think we end up then at once you find those new lows, right? You've got a new low. It's like, well, you can't just keep losing all your weight. Right. You know, so somebody says, I went from 300 to, to 250. You well done. And, and maybe from 50, 250 to 200, maybe even 200 to 150. But you can't keep doing that. Right. And therefore, you could just see a normalization. So I think it normalizes back to where we were, uh, hopefully by the year end, could be in the next year at around two, one and a half, one to two percent inflation, in which case. I've always thought the short rate probably should be 50 to 100 basis points above current inflation. And the long term, generally, 100 to 200 basis points above that. All right. Well, what a, a, a tremendous um, um, amount of knowledge that you shared with us today. I, I greatly appreciate it, Peter. How can listeners find out more about uh, the, you know, where they can get the, uh, the Lemon Letter? The Wonder of Me. The yes. Wonder of Me. You can find <laughs> out about the Wonder of Me. Well, it used to be easy. My mother passed away just prior to COVID. It used to be I'd just say, call this number, and she'll give you the Wonder of Me all day, right? But the easiest way is go to Lineman Associates. You'll see information about Lineman Letter. You'll see information about the two books. You'll see information about the Refia program. You'll see um, a number of talks um, that we post, like this event. You know, subsequently we'll post uh, when you post. Um, you'll um, uh, find out about the charity Sam Alimu, which is our 501c3, educating really some destitute but amazing kids in Kenya. Um, so yeah, Lineman Associates, and there's even a photo of me there, so you can be impressed, you know. Uh, anyway, so but thank you very much, Gary, for the opportunity today. Yeah, thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, this is Gary Lipsky signing off. I'll be back next week with another informative episode on the Real Estate Asset Management Podcast. To all of our listeners, thanks for joining us. And if you like this episode, please head over to iTunes or Stitcher and like, subscribe, and review this podcast as it will help us grow our audience and reach more people. And if you'd like to learn more about what we do at Break of Day Capital, head over to our website, breakofdaycapital.com, and sign up for our newsletter and or fill out our investor application. We'll talk to you next week.